triumphs of community-based game publishing. I'm here with folks who are frankly inspirational to my own work. But first, let me tell you about this panel. We know that some small indie game projects are created by an auteur who controls every aspect of the production. But for this panel of people right here, they rejected that model and instead assembled a team to create an anthology project on behalf of their community. Today, we're gonna to find out how, this, how these three different projects balance their individual ambition with their community's needs, or tried the possibly impossible task of representing a community via anthology. Now, this group of esteemed people is gonna introduce themselves in the order of how far they live away from the physical location of Metatopia. Starting with our friends on the continent, please introduce yourselves. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Olivia Montoya. Um, I, uh, I use she, her pronouns, and um, I was brought in to work on Make a Scene's LARP anthology project. Um, I mainly ran the Kickstarter, but I also contributed some art. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hear from Misha and then our friends across the sea. Misha, you are muted, at least for me. Yeah. We'll let Misha do battle with technology while we hear from Kiara and Oscar. Okay, hi, I'm Kiara, she, her. Uh, I live in Italy and I am the main translator and one of the writers in uh, Crescendo di Cosa and Crescendo di Cosa Ritornello, which are two uh, summer love anthologies uh, brought together uh, by our community of Light.it, which I let Oscar introduce. Hi, Kiara, I'm Oscar from Italy. I'm uh, one of the founder of uh, Live.it, our Chamber Lab community in Italy. And uh, we all together as a team, uh, we call ourselves uh, the Italian Chamber Orchestra. And uh, we wrote uh, Crescendo Giocoso and the Crescendo Giocoso Ritornello. Thank you. You ready to try one more time, Misha? I cannot hear you. All right, she's going to wage war off screen. Uh, and I am John Cole, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm one of the lead organizers of the Make a Scene Anthology Project, uh, which is out of Minnesota. And so if these uh, cool anthologies are a little new to you, that's because we're hoping to introduce them to you today. But let's hear from Misha one more time. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hey, yeah. I don't know what the hell happened. Uh, computers, fun. Uh, hi, I'm Misha B. Uh, I was one of the editors for Hashtag Feminism, which was a collection of nano games uh, that were mostly LARP-ish uh, or, or tabletop-ish, depending on how you wanted to play them. Uh, it came out a, a few years ago. So That's right. These games uh, that the commonality between these three projects, they might be sort of tabletop-ish, LARP-ish, larp top LARP in disguise, whoever you want to understand it. Let's go around in that same order and hear a little bit about the project, its scope, where it is at in its development cycle, and finally, why your group of, uh, where your anthology of games is an amazing first live action experience for tabletop gamers. Or I guess so I will not victimize anyone by forcing them to go first. I will allow people to volunteer themselves to introduce their project, its scope, where it's at now, and why it's a great first LARP for tabletopers. I'll start. So I ended the last one. Uh, so Hashtag Feminism, uh, it's a collection of nano games. Uh, they're really short, really sweet. Each of them is a page. Um, it's easy to pick up and run with. You can take the, the, the book is, you know, but yay big. You can pick it up, run with it. Uh, it's got a guide for how, uh, how emotional you'll probably get playing this game. Everything from, oh yeah, this is pretty light and fluffy to, okay, this is going to be really dark and depressing. You're probably going to need a really good DB debrief after uh and uh, any everything in between um it's easy they're all easy they don't require uh, props uh like one of the games requires you to print a couple of sheets but otherwise it's just go you don't need dice you don't need anything else just go um it's currently being uh, published by pelgrain press uh we sold the rights uh a couple of years ago uh, it was originally published in 2016, uh, and then republished in 2020, I want to say, uh, under Pelgrane's label. So that's where it is. It's available just about everywhere. Uh, and it's and fun. at risk of asking you okay, to repeat something, muted. Nisha. Oh. <laughs> Am I, in fact, muted? Okay, I'm, I'm now unmuted. Hooray. 
I had to um, drop and reconnect for it to reconnect. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Uh, people can hear me. People cannot hear me. Okay. Uh, Misha, at risk of asking you to repeat yourself. Well, okay. Uh, facilitation chip goes to someone else. It's Rod run free. I'm going to leave and come back. Uh, Kira, do you want to tell us about your game while we're waiting for John to pop back in? Uh, why not? Oscar, can, uh, do you want to start? Oh. Uh, uh, all right. I can uh, speak about our uh, community and uh, you can speak about the book. So you can speak better about the book than me in English. Okay. Um, so uh, when um, I start playing uh, live, because uh, to me they are just uh, live games, very simple. Uh, me and my wife Maria were just uh, you know sneaking in a tabletop convention and uh, asking to people, do you want to play something different? You know, and then uh, we start playing together this uh, kind of uh, little LARP, and uh, we are we were just uh, you know a stranger in a, a different kind of uh, old game uh, scene, and so uh, in uh, twenty twelve I think we just started to create our own convention when uh, where people uh, just uh, came to play LARP, uh, Chamber LARP, and we start to call them Chamber LARP when we met uh, different kind of LARP, and so it's very, it was uh, difficult to find a definition, but very easy to play for the first dance because uh, the the game were so so simple uh, so simple and uh, so easy to play for everyone and we have uh, a very different kind of person uh, and people uh, join our convention and it's one of the very more interesting thing about all this uh, all this stuff but Chiara can speak about Kashim uh, Bujuko's our book. Uh, yeah, uh, when we started working on Crescendo Giocoso, uh, we made it, uh, uh, our first thought was making it easy to pick up, even if you're not uh, a larger by nature or by tradition or whatever. Uh, we try to write the book so that you can just pick it up and read it uh, uh, step by step. It's an anthology, so there are more than one scenario. They're all very short. They can be played in one to four hours, depending on the game. So like a uh, one shot at tabletop, uh, and uh, they all are for a different number of players. But uh, they start at two players and they end at twelve, uh, or there are some that go higher. But the point is, you can play them in your own room. That's why they, we call them chamber, and uh, you can play them with your friends. And you can just pick up the book and start reading it out loud. It's all written in the, in the first person. So, okay, now we can gather the sheets and cut them up and do this and do that. So uh, it's very easy to pick up. There's no theory to read or long road distance to learn before you start playing. So it's a very immediate experience in that way. And, yeah, I, I think... Uh, this is one of the best things we did about the project. Uh, right now, we are at uh, two anthologies made by us, two extra anthologies made by guest authors, and uh, we are here in one of the biggest festivals in Italy selling our books, and that makes us infinitely happy. And yeah, we're thinking about uh, putting together a third one, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, can folks hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please finish, Oscar. Yeah, in, in a few words, our motto is uh, uh, no game master, no facilitator, just players. Because uh, we want uh, to share this uh, kind of game with a lot of, uh, of people. And in our community, a lot of people just uh, didn't want to, to be the master, the, the facilitator. And so we just uh, create uh, games for uh, players with no special uh, responsibilities uh, and so on. That's really cool. And I want to just applaud the commitment of uh, Kiara and Oscar, who are at another festival right now and are interneting into this one. Incredible. Olivia, would you be willing to take us, a trip, take us on a trip and tell us about the Make a Scene uh, scenario anthologies? Yes. So um, 
Uh, the Make a Scene Scenario Festival is uh, something that exists outside of just the anthologies. And in fact, the anthologies were sort of a response to um, the pandemic exists. How else can we like show these uh, these scenarios that were written for an in-person festival to, to premiere there and uh, make it so that there, there's still a project that people can still interact with and play these games, but how can we do it under these settings? So like the, um, the idea was, books make books um and um so there there are actually two anthologies that um we crowdfunded for uh with one kickstarter campaign um there the first one was for one year of these uh scenarios that it was that one is called uh wild heart land and didn't have a specific theme and uh the second is gender role play um uh, which is focused on the the theme of gender and exploring gender and um uh, the 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 festival uh recently happened in person again um and the the books still haven't been uh aren't finished being produced um that's still in progress um but the kickstarter was uh very successful uh raised over twelve thousand dollars us and uh it, it was a wild ride like uh like planning and running a kickstarter and um like all this uh, all this all the working different parts that move uh, and work together um and i guess why why it's great for a first larp for tabletop gamers um you can in on that if you've got something yeah you could leave it in that yeah go go ahead john <laughs> Um, the Make a Scene games, very much like Crescendo Giacosto, are written for first-time LARPers in mind. Uh, we poured over many hours the how to use this book, the uh, player support calibration, the accessibility chapters to make sure that these are games that just about anyone can run in their living room with a few friends and only minimal prep. Um, but thinking of minimal prep, I would like to direct our, our, our ears to the auditory stylings of our mega facilitator, Eric, who will tell us how you put questions in the chat and when we will answer them. Please take it away, Eric. Hello. Uh, for questions, you can just put in the chat. I will compile them. And at the end of the post, the John will ask us the questions. Well, ask for me for questions, and I will be able to provide them. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. So this panel is about uh, the challenges and triumphs of community-based game publishing. And I want to make sure we define the community. I'd like us to go around and briefly say, what community were you creating something on behalf of? And what responsibility do you feel, did you feel you owed them as you worked on this project? Okay. And uh, a live community is a community uh, based uh, not on, uh, on an area. We are not from the same region. We have, not, um, we have no political view in common or something like that. Uh, the community exists only because of uh, this kind of game. Uh, we, we keep together just to keep the flame uh, alive and uh, to play a different kind of game and uh, you can play uh, our way just in our convention and this is the reason why people uh, keep uh, coming for this and for the you know for for the love between uh, all the all the people uh, we always try to make people uh, comfortable even if, if we don't know them and uh, so we try to have uh, a very safe community and to play together this very specific kind of game and everyone is always welcome just to come and try and uh, if i may add on to that uh, i think our responsibility towards the community we represent was uh, trying to make the most out of, out of the games that we put out together uh, because uh, uh, like we tried to uh, this is going to sound pretty vulgar, but the record isn't coming to me. We try to not half ass things, okay? Uh, if you are giving me uh, your idea, your time, uh, your what, what we are doing together, I want to make sure we put out the best possible version of it. 
So uh, we pay a lot of attention both to form and to how to write the rules in a way that's, uh, uh, and that's true to the actual experience of the game. Because often we, when you're working speci specifically with LARP, you have games that were uh, designed uh, to be an event with uh, someone who had it in their mind and maybe never took note beyond uh, what they needed to do it. And so we did our best to put them in a form that was accessible to people who didn't have any idea what the, that kind of game was. So we're like, uh, we need to preserve the intent of the game in a way, if that makes sense. So um, uh, I, before I uh, was recruited to uh, do the Kickstarter for Make a Scene, um, I, I wasn't really a member of the community, and I, I was. But however, I was I, I was a LARPer in a different sort of different sort of style of LARP, um, and I was just really starting to get, become familiar with uh, the scenario style, um, and so like I felt like it was important to like. Uh, learn more about uh, the community and the style of games that were uh, being included in uh, in the anthologies and uh, make sure I was using the right terminology and not like pushing my views from my cult my other culture of LARP into uh, a, like into the Kickstarter but like still make it appealing to people from other communities who might think like oh this is familiar but different and I might want to try this out like but above all like uh, I care about um, lowering the barrier to entry for LARP. Um, it can be intimidating to some people, and I thought that this project would be perfect for that. To like, like, like these scenarios are meant to be uh, accessible, and someone who might otherwise have been a afraid of LARP or like is, isn't that something that requires a lot of prep or lots of costuming, and uh, to learn more about like the diversity of this hobby and this, the, these sort of communities. One responsibility that I feel uh, when working on the Make a Scene anthologies is the future ambitions for Make a Scene that we have. Make a Scene was started uh, from nothing in 2019 by Taylor Stokes and Catherine Shane. And Catherine Shane is a dynamite grant writer and so secured us some grant money in part because Minnesota has 10 times more money associated for art grants specifically than California, one of the most populous states in the U.S. Uh, due to a weird folk of Minnesota nature, uh, we are a dynamite place to get uh, grant money for LARPs. However, grant money is never guaranteed, so our hope for the Make a Scene anthologies was to um, create a little nest egg that we could hand to future organizers rather than having to dig into their own pockets to like rent a venue and the difficulties of producing an in-person art festival or a book or a book festival, just like because the United States is the way that it is, uh, having startup capital is really valuable and being able to hand startup capital to someone else, fingers crossed, is something we really hope to do. But Misha, have the microphone gods again blessed you with their booms? Hey, I don't know. Yes? No? Yay! Okay, cool. Uh, so Hashtag Feminism uh, was originally conceived to bring some awareness of feminism and feminist issues to uh the primarily festival initially, um, but also the LARP scene, in, the LARP scene in the U.S. in general, uh, and also uh, Northern Europe. Um, the community that we were targeting wasn't necessarily first-time LARPers, although a lot of the games are very accessible for first-time LARPers. Uh, they were meant more for uh, small community, um, like you know, one to five players, just being able to sit and chat and talk and, and work on things without, uh, again, no costuming required, no, uh, no silly accents required. You know, you don't have to do all that fun stuff. I mean, you can if you want. Don't let us stop you. But it's not required. Uh, and so it, it, it really was initially a bunch of people sitting around going, wouldn't it be cool if... Uh, and then it kind of blot snowballed from there. It's like uh, we, we started asking, hey, you want to do this? And then we started taking requests. And then we had to like get people to sit down and read them all. And that was a really fun weekend right before American Thanksgiving where I was reading them all and I'm sobbing at various points and trying to make pie and stuff and, and brine a turkey. Uh, and then we decided, okay, you, you have to put some emotional like indicators on these before they read them. So you're not reading all the heavy ones at one time. Uh, 
but it, it was uh, it was a labor of love. It, it was a, initially we weren't trying to raise money. Uh, the, the money that we did at the Indiegogo campaign for was primarily just to print it because we had this real image in our head that we wanted it to look like a uh, a ladies' magazine. Uh, so kind of glossy paper, uh, lots of visual pictures, lots of full color. Um, and it wanted it to be a physical artifact like that. So it's like, it's a glossy magazine that you'd find in a doctor's office or something that, you know, you can, you associate with that. And, and then the stuff inside we wanted to be, uh, some of it's super in your face. Some of it's a lot more subtle. Uh, and, and I think it worked out pretty well. I must say that hashtag feminism is a beautiful book that succeeds your design goals. And I also want to call out uh, the Crescendo Collections as being absolutely luxurious in their production values. Um, and production is one of the trickiest things, perhaps. I'm curious about what your team's number one challenge was as you as you activated for these anthologies. Was it production? Was it something else? Please uh, show us how the sausage is made. business and the biggest problem we had was just coordinating it all because we were in a time crunch we were trying to get it we started it september ish 2015 and we needed it complete and done before festival which i think was in march of 2016 so we had like a compressed time period uh and then we had to coordinate reading and playtesting and writing and and you know it's like okay you know if you don't get it in by this deadline we can't use it. And so some things I'm sure were brilliant and were written for it originally that never made it in. Um, and and most of it was just, yeah, a, lo a lot of time crunch because uh, we had a specific goal date in mind. Uh, I think that... Um... Uh, just the, the the fact that there was so there is so much that needs to get done when you are not only um, like uh, putting to editing all the, the all of the editing that has to be done for the scenarios the book has to be put together the Kickstarter has to be run and all the people doing those things who are all over the world in different time zones have to keep up with what each other are doing pass on information to who it needs to be passed on to. Um, version control and like making sure you're using the right source like the right images um doing your research about like uh like what what other similar projects have uh funded and not funded on kickstarter um all this stuff has to be coordinated and it, this the mountain is scary unless you like uh break it down into smaller parts so like i, I feel like uh the, the thing that was most helpful, at least uh, for me, was like the regular meetings um, that were held to like, like set, set like, okay, here's the things that need to get done. Like have us uh, like a, a really nice uh, like schedule for these meetings. Like, okay, here's what we're, we're going to go over. And uh, each person has their uh, say on the topic that they're working on and then set goals for the, uh, by the time the, uh, the next meeting happens. I wanted to say, Olivia, that you were instrumental in making that Kickstarter uh, profitable and successful. So again, thank you for your volunteerism there. Um, one challenge I want to mention briefly for the Make a Scene anthologies is all of these games were not written for an anthology. Only after the fact that we decided we wanted to republish them in an anthology. So everything had to be um, so basically streamlined to have a uniform use of terms and refer to a uniform safety section. And there was just quite a lot of, uh, of uh, dramatic editing work that the scenario authors and other editor Colleen Riley has done and they will continue to do until it's done. Ah, oh, yes, another note. Communication with all the people involved is pro was probably the biggest challenge. Um, like getting everyone to send in a headshot for uh, like the, the little uh, image of like, here's everyone's names with their pictures here's their bios getting all that ready for the kickstarter probably was like the biggest challenge of the kickstarter <laughs> we can see you uh, we had uh, quite different uh, challenges between uh, the first crescendo giocoso and the second one ritornello because you know the, the first in the first one we had to set all the, the graphics uh, the the idea the format and the book and so on and the project was uh, quite like you know uh, Pavarotti and friends because you had six game uh, by me and then six by single authors friend of mine 
member of the community. But in the second one, Ritornello, we had all the graphics sets. It was uh, all uh, okay. We we just uh, made it before, but uh, we we had uh, a real orchestra with uh, thirty authors and uh, uh, with game written for uh, the anthology this time. So in the for the first crescendo, the situation was like uh, make a scene. I think with uh, already written uh, games. Uh, and uh, my work of editing on them uh, to adapt them uh, to an idea, uh, and my idea of uh, proposing this thing, kind of game. But uh, with the second book, we already had uh, the concept and we wrote the game all together just to put them on the anthology. We create um, a, a writing convention, a large gem, and uh, uh, people who uh, played with us for many years uh, and just find uh, you know the, the will the courage to just start writing because we we, we we were in bands we were together and so I can help uh, other guys uh, and girls who just uh, didn't write again before and so we achieved uh, uh, an anthology with all our games written just for Crescendo Giocoso Ritornello. Yeah, and I think something that helped a lot with that was creating a common framework. Because for the first one, as the first day, we got games that were designed by different people with different goals. So we had to uniform them, make them uniform. And so we tried to find a structure that would make sense to present games in. And then that was the structure that we used in the writing workshop that Oscar mentioned. So we have a convention. And you, you have maybe a team for the group, but you can do anything within it uh, uh, as long as you try and uh, fit the pieces into the framework. It's also an aid for people to uh, think about the game, to design it. Uh, whereas before it was just, uh, you know, a type setting tool, it became a design tool as well. And it helps people to have uh, a basic structure to put their ideas in order and make a game, you know, and I think that is one of the best things we did with the project. Yeah, the, the first time we, we ran uh, LARP Jam, I asked it to other people who tried something similar and uh, they say to me, we spend all the first day speaking about what kind of game we're going to write. Uh, we, do, uh, we didn't want to, to waste our time in the same way. So we ask to people, okay, came and uh, we try to, to write a game for Crescendo Giocoso. We can know if the game uh, will be, you know, uh, just good and we can uh, put it uh, in the anthology, but uh, let's try to write it as uh, if it's going in the anthology. And uh, this was the secret uh, to be all together on the same page. I'm hearing that frameworks and constraints are really important, right? The extremely short length of hashtag feminism or the, the very laid out structure of the Crescendo projects, uh, something that my esteemed co-panelists are too humble to flex on uh, to let the haters know that there are brand new LARP authors in all of these collections. That's really powerful. That is a, a big move for equity. Do people want to expand on that at all in order to flex? Show off your guns. Uh, it's been a while, so I don't remember how many of these people were brand new at the time. I know, I know at least three or four of the ten authors were. This was the first LARP they'd written, um, and they did amazingly uh, well done jobs. Um, I know for me, it was our my first like editing project. Uh, so that was like a big, <laughs> it's like, oh, we're going to do a giant book the first time. Um, and so it, it was, I know so many people's first times or the first time they at least felt comfortable trying, uh, was, it was an option, uh, because we did kind of make it a, it was a volunteer opportunity. It was not a, uh, we weren't doing it to, to try to make a lot of money. So we weren't, um, we weren't really trying to make any money. Uh, all the proceeds that we've raised from it have gone to uh, charities. Um, uh, Planned Parenthood uh, received a, a, like a third of the uh, uh, 
none of the individual authors got like a, a separate payment. Uh, we all agreed that we were going to donate all the proceeds. So it, it made it easier to not have so many egos on the line because it's like, okay, I'm not out for, this is not for me. This is for something else. And so it was easier to, for a lot of people, I think to just say, Hey, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. I will try this thing. If it's great. Cool. If it's not great, maybe they can make it better. And if it really sucks, I hope they'll tell me nicely. <laughs> Uh, which, you know, we, we didn't, fortunately we didn't have any that sucked. So it was great. It worked out really well. Uh, and we were able to polish up anything that needed to be polished up and, and it turned out pretty good. I think while we talk about mentorship, I also want to just keep the brag train going, you know, go off your majesty. Is there anything else you would like to brag about of the successes of hashtag feminism, Michelle, while we've got you here? Uh, we were featured at E3. We were featured at IndieCade. Uh, we... I think we won an indie groundbreaker. Uh, we were nominated for a couple of innies. Uh, I, I, that's a whole other discussion uh, because LARPs are games and should be a category at the indies, but we're, we, they aren't ready for that conversation yet. Uh, so <laughs> that, that, that's a, a one for later, later books. Um, and yeah, it's been played at uh, museums. It's been played at art galleries. Uh, it's been played in classrooms. Uh, it's been a, a really kind of fun, exciting ride to go with it. Well, as long as we're on the bragging train, uh, and uh, Misha mentioned the Indie Groundbreakers, Crescendo uh, di Tornello, which is the second anthology we made and uh, was published uh, in. I think this summer, no, no, wait, uh, this um, uh, I think last summer. I don't remember the dates, I am bad with dates, but anyways, uh, it won uh, the Indie Groundbreaker Award, the Game of the Year, and that was seriously the, you know, getting recognition from an award we actually followed uh, to know what. We'll assume that uh, sharks have attacked the, the transatlantic cable. And we will. Oh, Kara, we've got you back. Go ahead where you were. You were saying that you won this award that you had followed for some time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, I, it's, just, uh, uh, it's something uh, uh, to get recognition outside of your field, both in terms of geography, because we're all the other way of the pond, and uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, as we mentioned before uh, the, the panel, uh, being recognized as real role-playing games because uh, sometimes there is this thing that LARP is not actually a game or it's a different kind of game and to us it's all the same, it's just telling stories together, it's different ways of doing it. And being recognized as that was pretty awesome. I mean, you know. I also uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the Kickstarter for uh, Make a Scene's LARP anthologies uh, raised over twelve thousand dollars, which is uh, over two hundred and thirty percent of our goal. Um, and we funded really quickly, like um, after having um, run a personal Kickstarter for um, a Zine Quest project, it was nerve wracking about whether it would fund. But this funded very quickly, which made the rest of the uh, the month of the Kickstarter uh, a little less stressful than I was worried about. <laughs> To us, make a scene has been quite special, you know, because uh, we in Italy always played American games or uh, Nordic games. And uh, uh, one of the reasons of Crescendo Giocoso is uh, trying to show our way of uh, creating games. And so know about uh, an American project looking at the Crescendo Giocoso as a source of inspiration to us was uh, very important. And uh, so I just know you to know. Yes, actually, both Hashtag Feminism and Crescendo uh, shared uh, knowledge and resources. And so when Oscar sent over like, a little budget breakdown, that took us from can we do this to let's do this. That was very valuable. Um, and I want to briefly say that the equity thing that Mixine does or is doing that I'm proud of is assigning all of our authors and experienced mentor to sort of bounce ideas off of. Other scenario festivals do this, but I think it helps us 
be more accessible to the number of brand new LARP uh, authors who have written games specifically for Make a Scene. Um, and I, I, I've got no. Okay, we're coming up soon on the time where we get to hear questions from the audience, but I've got one more question. Um, and this is about getting real politic about uh, how we organize uh, LARP anthologies. How did you compensate your people, either with money, either with intangibles? Because I want you to know, or I guess we'll find out if anybody's making money, if anyone's gonna become fantastically rich uh, running uh, like anthology projects, how the sausage gets made. This is important for people to know if they want to do something similar. Please, how do you compensate your people, tangibly or intangibly? Uh, well, I think uh, we can start since you mentioned that we shared uh, our button with you, and that too. Uh, and the question of the whole model is uh, like, okay. Uh, let, let me try to <laughs> break it down. Is this, uh, we try to compensate people uh, on how much they contribute to the um, anthology. What I mean, we have individual authors who maybe can't get monetary compensation for how the, uh, the business model works, basically. Uh, every author uh, knows that if they give us uh, their game to work on, uh, they... Uh, I mean, we try to make it things clear from the start that we are not in the position to be able to compensate everyone as they as if they were writers. But on the other side of that is the fact that you can uh, like uh, give Oscar, me, and Maria our graphic uh, the idea of the game, and we will work on it for you, and you will have right to use the text basically uh, in its refined form. It's your game basically. Um, you can also publish it in other ways if you want. Uh, we only reserve rights to the text as it is inside Christian proposal. And that is one way to try to uh, you know, compensate for the fact that we aren't actually able to pay 30 people to write the anthology. Also, we try to provide copies of the game to everyone in the project to credit them properly, to keep them involved at all stages. And basically, the work with Christian proposal is on a work on it as much as you want basis. So uh, if you just want to leave us the idea and go away and do your thing, that's okay. You are not required to work for us for free. So uh, like in the community, we try to take the responsibility of working on the game, uh, on the boring stuff that's like translating, uh, type setting, uh, editing uh, the, the text uh, uh, I mean, on the grammatical level or whatever is to be done, so all the technical, practical work that there is to be done, that's on us three, which are basically the people running the Kickstarter also and publicizing the game and so on. And everyone else uh, can just work on the fun part, which is making games. So we try to do that. And I hope I explain it as well. <laughs> Yeah, just to give uh, you an idea, uh, we are now um, a publishing house too. We make ad adaptation of international game, tablet or game, but uh, we can sell Crescendo Giocoso and the Crescendo Gio Giocoso Ritornello only directly, not with uh, middlemen or so on, because uh, we just can afford it. And uh, we are selling it through in the press revolution just because uh, we want uh, to share our way of, uh, of playing but everyone in the project know we are just uh, volunteering to share our passion uh, to this kind of game so we try to compensate people with uh, uh, you know satisfaction uh, uh, with uh, presence in the convention with uh, game copies uh, and so on but we can't afford to to pay every single author so we are going to pay a different kind of uh, of professional uh, for example uh, chiara joined our project as a, as a translator and then she started to write uh, this kind of game and so we try to just you know to take people together uh, with a volunteering basis. Uh, which has, uh, I can talk. Uh, which has, I can say this word with hashtag feminism. Uh, we we did it. Like I said, it was a uh, volunteer, and all of the authors uh, agreed that we were going to donate the proceeds. Um, we donated it to uh, I Need Diverse Games. 
uh, which is an organization that helps get marginalized voices opportunities to write games. Um, and we donated the other part to the Guttmacher Institute, which is works to keep uh, abortion safe, sane, and legal in various places around the world. Uh, so every year we get this royalty check, we split it up, we send it back out. Uh, and all of the authors uh, agreed that that was the best use of the funds. Uh, that and trying to figure out how to track and split royalties between like 20 people was was a little more than we wanted to take on. <laughs> uh, which is why we were like, hey, are you all cool with this? And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. And fortunately, they, they were all cool with it. Uh, so... Yes, make a scene uh, similarly. Oh, go for it, Kiara. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to reiterate that the important part is making things clear before you have people do some work for you. If you lay things down clearly, then people can either set things as they are to put something else or something might you have to be clear. And I strongly suspect all these esteemed panelists would be willing to share contracts uh, that they've drawn up to for inspiration. Uh, we took, uh, similarly, make a scene, uh, did, uh, avoided the dodge the royalty check problem by giving all our volunteers, uh, a, a, a like fixed honorarium price. Uh, we're paying everyone something. We're not paying anyone what they're worth is what our grants allow us to do this time. Uh, like the crescendo projects, uh, people get, uh, gratis copies for their contributions. Um, and authors can republish their scenarios elsewhere. Though, of course, we think that the beautiful art we've commissioned and the editing work we've done mean that the Make Scene Scenario Anthology will be the definitive edition. But of course, they have rights to their own work. And if there's nothing oh. else to add, Olivia's got something. Oh, yeah, I was just going to add that, like, uh, when um, I was recruited, um, like, it was made clear to me, like, this is basically volunteer. We can't pay you what we know your worth, but um, that, like, as a volunteer, uh, uh, I I feel like getting a little extra money, like from something that I know I would have done anyway. Like um, it it was a perk, <laughs> um, but like it it also it, it like getting a chance to do volunteer work in an area that I really care about was uh, great. Thank you. And we're just at the forty second minute mark, so we will summon our uh, our voice in this guy, Eric. Tell us about questions from the audience. Well, currently, you guys have the rapid attention of all the attendees that were viewing in, and there's no current questions, so you can continue talking among yourselves. Excellent. Um, well, I think we'll jump to this question then. Um, if you could go back in time to yourself as you were just getting started on this project, and you leap out of the time machine, you only have, you know, what would you want to tell yourself about? never have a meeting without an agenda ever <laughs> i mean I, I so uh the the primary editors for me lizzie stark and anna westerling uh i love them i love them dearly but we could go off topic and have like three hour meetings where we really worked on like maybe 30 minutes worth of stuff but we just so it it, it led to some long meetings uh so yeah never Never go into a meeting without an agenda of what you play, what you need to get answered this time and what steps you're going to have going forward when you come out of it. Uh, one of the things, like, not necessarily that it didn't work, so I'd want to go uh, tell myself, do this correctly, but that, like, I think a good lesson that I learned um, uh, that about running Kickstarters and uh, big projects in general is uh, the uh, you you can't just launch uh, a Kickstarter and expect people to find it or even just start advertising shortly before. We did all we could. You, you've got to keep your advertising of your uh, your project consistent and not just weeks beforehand, like month at least a month beforehand, like. 
have have your Twitter going, like um, I post regularly on various social media accounts. Um, we did lots of social media. Um, had like a, a channel on our uh, a Discord server, like just like here's some content we can like uh, promote, and like also doing cross promotion um, with other projects because we uh, overlapped with the uh, Zine Quest on Kickstarter, so we did a lot of cross promotion there and also like helped out some cool indie games get funded uh it it like it it, it it sort of strengthens the community as well when you work that way you lift each other up yeah um seriously i i want to second the thing about uh, uh getting informed about how kickstarter works for example and uh, how promotion on kickstarter works so it's like something really dumb that happened to us is that we put our um our project into the light game section instead of the role playing game section. When uh, role playing is fine for LARP, I mean, there are other projects that have advertised uh, role playing uh, even though they were LARP. And that really makes a lot of difference in how many people who might be interested in your game look at the page. And this is a LARP specific example, but in general, trying to get a sense of what kind of uh, Category advertising would work best for your project before you start it and uh, you find that you've been crippled by the algorithm or whatever is really important on that. Yeah, as an editor of uh, the project, I think uh, I will tell to my past self <clears throat> to not be afraid to talk with, uh, with people because if you have built uh, a good community, you can just say to people uh, what you want for the anthology and they are going to listen to you because they want uh, the project be as awesome as possible. So it's not a problem to, you know, change something on a game if uh, we do it together. So past Oscar, don't be afraid to, to say to the other guys in uh, Crescendo Giocoso, how, uh, do you, what do you think about their game? It's not a problem. Yeah, I think uh, there's one specific example that I think Oscar has in mind. We have one game in Crescendo de Pozzoli Tornello, which is called Fire and Lead, which now has uh, a setting based on Italian history, uh, like the 70s, which were periods full of conflict and like uh, in-house terrorism. And so it was a good setting for a detective story, which the game is. But when it was first developed, it was just like generic detective story set in New York. And so we thought, okay, the mechanical thing are really cool, but the setting is doesn't make the most out of them. Okay, so there was this disconnect, and we just talked to the authors, and uh, we had some frank discussions about what the game needed to be or the collection, and we thought having something based in our culture will be, you know, have more value for the project rather than speaking about America when none of us have ever been to America, for example. So, uh, you know, the authors weren't all convinced. There were some discussions, not everyone agreed, but everyone was frank. And at, at the end, one of the authors told us, okay, I don't agree with this, but I trust you to make the best out, out of this. So talking actually does work. And I think that's a good example for us, you know. That is an awesome concrete story. Folks, behind the curtain view into how Crescendo came to be, the setting got changed for publication. Um, Make a Scene has done things not quite that bold, but we've also had some conversations with authors. But before I go off with my time travel agenda, I got word from Eric that a question has appeared in the chat. Let's hear that question. Yes, John. The question comes from I'm Kevin Kevin, who asks, how do we establish expectations to get everyone on the same page for a cohesive project? I guess it depends on how cohesive a project you want. Uh, hashtag feminism is very disparate. Like there are, we, we put out a call asking for games with the general uh, tag that we wanted them to be about feminist issues. And that was all the constraint we gave people. So we got everything from, hey, how do I talk about sex with my parents? To how do we talk about sexual assault in the military? 
to uh, how do we talk about intergenerational feminism uh, among black women on a road trip. So it was disparate, but that was okay. And then once those games came in, we were then able to say, okay, these are the general themes that we're seeing and we were able to group them that way. So it just, it's a matter of how much do you, do you want to have a theme? Do you, how cohesive do you want the whole thing to be? And it doesn't have to be cookie cutter. I mean, you don't want it to be cookie cutter. Um, you just want it to have a feel that's similar. So yeah, with the, with the only constraints we gave were we, we needed to fit on like a page front and back and we needed to be about a feminist issue. And that's all we did. So um, we had a lot of discussions about like, how are we going to convey all that is contained in these anthologies? And like, um, especially when we're communicating um, with people whose experience of LARP is different or even aren't really familiar with LARP at all. Um, so what we did on the Kickstarter page is um, we first gave like a little summary of like here's what you would do in like these games and like one line per game um like uh in this uh in this uh one of the uh, anthologies you will reveal you're not an earthling to your stereotype spouting space friends and then like on and on and on and um that's like to draw people in like oh this sounds fun and then uh we sort of explained like what is make a scene uh what exactly are we creating we had a section titled that like okay here's the details of what this project is what the, is going to be in the books and then we had a section called who are these games for so um we we intentionally said we're, we want to bring in newcomers um uh we want this to have a low barrier to entry these can be run almost anywhere um and uh explained like okay here's what we mean by scenario um and then we we gave more details about like the uh like what size are the books going to be what um like what options are there for that um uh, and then there was details about all the scenarios and uh bios of like all of the people who worked on the project which took out a, up a significant amount of space because so many people contributed to this um and then we did some targeted advertising in specific places where we thought people would be interested in this kind of project like um not uh, like there were facebook ads um and we uh went in and advertised uh directly um in discord servers facebook groups um we uh, there were some uh feature uh on podcasts um so Basically, we tried to find people who are interested in adjacent things uh, and not just like people who like this exact, who are already in, in, involved in this exact style of LARP scenario. Olivia and it worked. Did, Olivia did a commendable job uh, leading our, our Kickstarter advertising. If I could do it all again, I wish that our call for scenarios for people to write for us was treated with the same level of social media expertise. Of course, we all learned a lot uh, running this Kickstarter campaign about social media. We did have a public open call and a curatorial committee was formed to review all of the, uh, the short two page pitches, select a few for development. So that was the first sort of uh, stage of alignment with our theme uh, for 2020, it was gender diversity. That's the 2020 anthology. And then when it came time to do editing for the republishing, with the help of our wonderful editor, Colleen Riley, we developed a style guide of what we expected to see in each scenario. Once again, very similar to what Shoda has done. Um, and then assigned each game a lead developmental editor to help the author whip it into shape uh, for anthology material before handing the you know, almost ready to go uh, version to Colleen so she could do that professional editing uh, high pass on it. Shendo Giacoso, it's uh, less about uh, team and uh, more about uh, game mechanics, you know. So no game master, no facilitator is the, the first rule. And uh, uh, in, the, in the second one, in uh, Crescendo Giacoso Ritornello, uh, everyone can be part of the orchestra, but you have to be part of the orchestra to join the book. So we, uh, everyone had uh, a common ground, a, a, a shared experience uh, of playing uh, so everyone knows uh, uh, know what kind of game can be right for Crescendo Giocoso not just me, 
but everyone who joined uh, maybe you know uh, i know a lot of, of friends uh, who write a very good game with uh, game master when uh, they as a uh, as author just you know uh, enjoy be an npc and uh, and do a lot of stuff they can be wonderful games but they are not game for crescendo giocoso i know it they know it and so we are good with it yeah, and another thing that uh, we haven't mentioned already is the musical metaphor, you know, uh, we talk about orchestras and the game is shaped like an album cover and so on, because we have to find uh, a tall line uh, in the graphics and in the style of the book, uh, because the games were so very heterogeneous. So we had fantasy games, we had sci-fi, we had contemporary games, and a lot of stuff to put together into a one coherent whole. And uh, on that, graphics really came to our aid because we said, okay, we can do one, dinner, one setting, we can choose one over the other. So uh, that thing to do was just, okay, we settle on a main theme and the music can be any side, any genre. And that was our starting idea for the project. So we started making everything music themed. We became an orchestra, and uh, you know we had jam sessions, and that was uh, in the right frame of mind, uh, you could say, to have something in common, even when we're all doing something so different from each other. So yeah. And all of this make uh, Crescendo Giocoso a, a quite difficult project to communicate. Uh, because you, you don't you don't have a, a, a very strong team, you don't have a, a setting, a common setting, um, an established color, so it's quite difficult to to communicate. But uh, we we do our best to to find people who are gonna take their time to understand our way of playing. So we are good with that, but uh, it's always difficult to, to, to communicate uh, our project uh, just because we don't have a strong point uh, beside, okay, we are Italian authors who can be interesting or not. Uh, it depends on the audience. Thank you all. Eric, is there one last question floating around in the void? No, probably a good time to wrap it up. Maybe perfect. For you guys. Let's just do a, a speed round of our last three minutes where we uh, remind everyone of our wonderful names and, more importantly, where they can find our wonderful projects. Oh, uh. Sure. uh <laughs> Hi, I'm HB. Uh, you can find me online at BG Gameworks uh, or BlackGirlGameworks.com, and you can find hashtag uh, feminism at PilgrimPress.com. So I'm Olivia Montoya. She, her. Um, you can you can't get the uh, make a scene LARP anthologies yet. Um, but uh, they're coming eventually. And if you want to play some of the scenarios that are in the books, we are having an online day of play coming up in November. Um, so that uh, you'll get a link uh, for where you can uh, sign up and to play these games online. Okay, I have the Chiara uh, and uh, you can find uh, both Crescendo the Cosa, Crescendo the Cosa Ritornello, and some info on the way we play games with some scenarios to try out for two people in your house. So it's all fine, even in uh, lockdown and so on. On uh, live.it, that's uh, L A A I D dot IT. Yeah, and I'm Oscar. <laughs> I'm Oscar Biff from Italy. Uh, you can find my project in the same place of, uh, of Chiara and on our other website as a publishing house. It's uh, Nessun Dove in Italian. It's N E S U N D O V E dot IT. Quite difficult, but you can find it. And I'm John Cole. I organize with Make a Scene, which you can find at Make a Scene MN for Minnesota dot org. Um, and the day of online play is this November 13th. Please come play some games with us online. Uh, this has been the challenges and triumphs of community-based game, game publishing. Again, I'm 
uh, spoiled by these esteemed co-panelists talking about how their stuff is made. We hope that everyone has a great Metatopia. Thank you all so much. Goodbye.